You are listening to Catholic Family Podcast, Episode 10. Thank you very much for listening. I'm Kevin Davis, and I'm joined today by two of my favorite people in the world, two priests, uh, my parish priest, Father Johannes Heine, here from Munich, Germany, and Father Carlos Borja, who is now stationed in Omaha, Nebraska. I've known them both for a very, very long time. I think now just kind of pushing 20 years. And up to this point, they have um, still remained in contact with me, which is, speaks very highly to their sanctity. And <laughs> one of the, the topics I want to talk about is, is um, being hopeful in our position and, and the, the, the positive sides of our position as Sede Vacantis a word that is often thrown around as a pejorative and kind of used in the same sentences with heresy and schism. But we want to talk about the positive sides of it and why it's a good thing. And that's why I have on the two of the more hopeful people I know. So, Father Heine, thank you for joining. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for having me. And Father Borja, you as well? Yes, thank you, Kevin. And, and I have to say, like I said, the two most hopeful people I know, Father Borja, simply because he's been one of my best friends for 20 years, that just shows that he obviously must have an extreme uh, form of hope. Father Heine, I have to tell a short story real quickly about mine and Father Heine's um, <laughs> relationship in, in terms of hope. We were we were on a bike trip going to Hungary or through Hungary, which is it, it's it's gotten me some time off my purgatory time. Let's just say that. And we we're going through this 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 little portion of about maybe an hour or two where it was literally riding a bike through sand. And it's exactly as you could expect. It was about 40 degrees Celsius, so about hundred degrees Fahrenheit. And after a while, father, father Heine turns to me and says, Kevin, isn't this great? It's just like biking through a desert. <laughs> and I said, yes, yes, father, it is. Uh, anyway, we're not going to talk about bike trips in today's episode. We're going to talk about state of a contism and what it means, um, literally the definition of the term, and why we are all behind this position. So, Father Heine, I'd like to start with you, and if you could just tell me, tell the audience, it, literally, what does the term state of Vacantism mean? Um, state of Vacantism, I mean, uh, state of Vacante is usually the, um, an, an expression for, like, the time when the sea is vacant, uh, the papal see is vacant. Usually, that was always happened um, when uh, one pope died and uh, a new pope was not um, elected or enthroned yet. So that was a time of um, where the see was vacant. And um, uh, why we say state of vacantism today is because we would say that the papal see is vacant because. There is a person sitting on there, but um, but it has, in our eyes, no authority because he basically put himself outside the church because he is not Catholic anymore, so he can't be our head. So we are today without a head and without a without a somebody sitting on the papal throne, basically because he uh, because there is no Catholic per person sitting on there. Basically, that's why we would basically more or less say we live in a in a time of state of occultism basically and and father borja why do we believe specifically why do we believe that the seat has been vacant since 1958 well the thing is as father heine was saying <clears throat> that they the claimants to the papal throne since the late 50s since 1958 have espoused uh, heresy and have contradicted church uh, teaching that has been defined uh, by previous popes. And so it is that there's, you know, a handful of things. You think of, uh, of, of, of false ecumenism, uh, the aspect that all religions are fine and dandy, all religions lead to heaven. That's a condemned, uh, that's a condemned proposition by the church. And you have, uh, since Vatican II, these men claiming that other religions are good. Um, you have, for example, the Assisi meetings, uh, where they got together with these other religions and, uh, like I said, praised them and prayed together with them, which is, a, like I said, an a act against our Catholic faith. Um, you also have religious uh, liberty, saying that re other religions have the same um, 
have the same freedom to practice the their faith as the Catholic faith has that freedom or that right from God. Um, that's been condemned, the fact that other religions are false uh, and that they do not have a right to uh, practice or to spread their errors. Um, we also have, uh, for example, uh, the aspect that the Pope is just a another one amongst the other bishops and not really much of a of a he's one amongst the others and doesn't have a position of authority uh, unless he is connected with the other bishops, etc. I believe that's called collegiality. But we have these at least these three points that come to my mind where uh, they since Vatican II, these men uh, who claim to be the Pope have have espoused these and have pu publicly taught them and promoted them and spread them amongst the Catholic faithful. And how can we, Father Heine, how can we, as as people, as lay people, how can we judge? Many people would say it's not our right to judge a pope, that a pope must be judged by a future pope. So how can we say that Francis now, or even the, 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 the quote unquote popes before him, how can we have the right to say that they were not true popes? Um, I would, what I would say is that I think um, even most, like like even most a um, little bit more traditional thinking or Catholic thinking people notice is that just like Father just said, the teaching has changed. And um, so we have to give an answer for ourselves at least. We have to come to a point where we wonder, okay, which teaching is right? Was it what the popes before um, Vatican II uh, taught was right or was it right what they teach now? So I don't think there is much of a much of a um, judging the Pope. It's more like a question or a noticing that what he says contradicts what the Popes before said. Just like as I said, you know, Father Borja just pointed out very nicely what he what the differences are. And um, so I think it's more like uh, they touch they judge themselves or they put themselves in a state of teaching something new, teaching something not Catholic, teaching something that is contr con contrary to what Jesus said. And uh, so um, that would be my uh, approach to this question, and because I don't see much really active judging. Uh, it's more like uh, finding out that there is a contradiction and then wondering, do I want to stay with, with the 200, uh, almost 2,000 years before, or do I want to stay with the teaching of the last uh, 60 or whatever years? I guess. Yeah. And so, F Father Borja, why is it that if the teachings are so different from, from the past nearly 2,000 years of church history, why did so few people follow, or why did so many people, I should say, why did so many people follow the, the Vatican Church? Well, we know that as Catholics, we we owe obedience to, to the Pope, and we obviously are taught uh, by in our Catholic faith to uh, the spirit and the, and the virtue of obedience. And I think that many people were very, uh, in, in, in the 60s, those were very turbulent, 60s and 70s, very turbulent times. Uh, and a lot of people did not understand you know, what was going on, and they were taught obedience. And I think that that is one of the main reasons why so many went along with it and didn't really they might have wondered, you know, why is this going on, but didn't really do much about it because of the fact that, well, this is being done in in the uh, under under the the name of authority, uh, and so we we obey. And so, Father Father Heine, one of the arguments you hear very often is that our Lord told Saint Peter, of course, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Many people argue that. The state of a contest must believe that the gates of hell have prevailed if Rome has been without a pope for, for 60 plus years. But what would you be your argument against that um, thought? Um, maybe I can uh, pick up what Father Borja just said and like add also that one of the reasons why there's this confusion is because the new, this new, um, what's so new about the situation today is that the enemies of the church went inside and infiltrated the church and 
said what they are saying is still Catholic, or they they came out with the appearance of being the Catholic Church. And I think that's what um, confuses confused many people. And that's maybe also the answer to your question, um, to that question now, because um, I don't I don't really see uh, how the hell has prevailed against the church. We are just without without a head, or let's say the enemies have infiltrated into the church and have usurped uh, the seat of Peter. Um, but that doesn't mean that the church is, is destroyed. I mean, the church, I think, as we see, there are still many um, people who hold the Catholic faith. There are priests and bishops who hold the Catholic faith, who uh, um, who administer the the true sacraments, the Catholic sacraments, who teach the Catholic faith, and so forth. So I I see um, I see the the church still living, and just because we have no authority, no leading authority, no head right now, I don't see why that would mean that the church is is destroyed or that hell would have prevailed against. Um, the church. And so the church still survives even without the, the, the head authority. And I think obviously that makes sense. And, and as you say, we have to see you, you have to see what is happening now. We have to watch with our own eyes and see, and we, we don't follow just because someone calls himself Pope. We don't fall him off a cliff and, and literally into the, the, the pits of hell, because I think that's, that's very right. clearly where they are, are leading um, people and today. Yeah, and I, as I said, you know, I, I heard this argument um, before, um, but I don't really see why why people think if that would be, if if that is truly the case that the enemies have have put themselves on the throne of Peter, why that should destroy the church? I mean, why the church is still living and um, we can still practice our faith and hold up the faith? I guess you know. I guess I don't. Do you have an answer for that? Uh, also, Father Borja, or. I did want to add to that. Uh, there, His Excellency, Bishop Piperunas, wrote a little pamphlet called Answering the Objections to the Sedevacantist Teaching, or Sedevacantist Position, based on the teachings of the Catholic Church. And he gives five objections that people uh, make against the Sedevacantist Position. And it, this is the second objection that he puts in his pamphlet. Uh, he's saying, if the Vatican II Pope's were invalid, uh, excuse me, Vatican Council one taught that St. Peter had perpetual successors, long vacancies in the See of Peter are not possible. Uh, that's the objection. And the answer, just in short, was that an extended interregnum may occur and does not contradict perpetual successors. And then he gives a, uh, a handful of references to back this up. Uh, and so, they, you know, it, it, essentially that it doesn't, and then where does the church teach that there may not that an interregnum may not be more than uh, than a few days or a few months mm -hmm. or that it can even extend for years? Uh, mm -hmm. The church never says that at a particular time, and so it it doesn't it doesn't take away from the fact that we believe in the in the in papal infallibility. We believe in we uphold the papacy. Uh, in indefectibility of the church, et cetera. And these are the reasons why we take this position because of the fact that if we accept these Vatican II uh, men as popes, uh, then we then the church truly would have been uh, prevailed against. The gates of hell would have been prevailed would have prevailed against the church because of just of that whole aspect of them uh, of what they're teaching and the souls that they're leading away from God, that they're leading to the hell. And that would definitely mean that the church would have failed. And Father Heine, what is the difference now? I think Father Father Borja mentioned it a bit earlier, but what is the difference now in our position? Than it, what's the difference now than it was for our parents back in the 1960s and 70s or, or 80s? I mean, it, it's a little clearer now, right? Yeah, that would be my, my first, uh, what I would say at first is that we... Uh, see much more of the fruits that those changing uh, changes brought forth, you know, um, or the destruction and the loss of vocations, the destruction of the monasteries and convents and 
the seminaries and um, and so forth, and also also the confusion amongst the people and uh, where the the so-called pope went now. I mean, Francis makes it so easy for us, I think, or Bergoglio, let's say, makes it so easy for us um, because he's so cl so clear about his his new teaching that even, as I said, you know, even people who try to uh, cling to the fact that this is still the Catholic Church, even they um, say that this is heresy. And, you know, I mean, we've heard the, the, uh, the fraternal correction from, uh, from um, Berg, Cardinal Berg and so forth. And they, they I mean, they clearly uh, ex expressed that this is heresy, what you're saying. So we see the fruits. And um, that's a big help, I think. Um, also, we, uh, I think we have a lot, lot more structure, um, if we want to, if we want to call that that. There have have been established certain certain uh, like parishes and a certain structure, a provisional structure, I guess, that helps us also. And. Um, from what I hear from people back then, when the changes first came, um, and what we do now, back then I think they were much more um, like against those changes and against um, their parish priest and whatever. I think today we kind of answered mostly those questions for ourselves, and we now have the head free, or they answered, our parents and, and grandparents answered those questions for us. And now we, I think, we have the, the head free a little bit to, to be uh, for something and to build something. Those would be like um, some of the most important, I think, differences that come to mind right now. Do you have anything to add to that, Father Borja? No, I I agree with Father. I think it's been over the years just be, been made a lot more clear to to us and to and to those who um, have eyes to see, so to see, so to say. Excuse me. Um, that just the fruits of of where the their their heresies have have led them to and being able to be more able to show people you know this is exactly uh what is wrong and you can see it from a b and c and you can point to these things and whereas before i think it was a lot more it was just more, much more confusing whereas now it's like father was saying it's been made much clearer Right, and and I think that I don't want to get into the the R and R, the the recognize and resist movements, because that's a a very different topic, very long topic, and and a not a very happy topic. And I, and I want this show to be a little more of a uh, optimistic approach. And I think that how I'd like to, I guess the next question or, or how I'd like to phrase the next line of thinking is is why is it why is our position, even though it's labeled as being bad or schismatic or heretical from the 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 church in in rome and from the r and r group what 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 are the the fruits that we see from our position uh, father i know i'll ask you first um maybe i could uh, again start or pick up something that father Borja said before when he said like the gates of the hell um, have prevailed against or would have prevailed against the church if that was still the Pope and um, or if that was still the Church of Christ in the name of the Novus Ordo Church and um, I think for us the good thing is that we don't have that um, it's much easier for us to to build something and um, to uh, to uh, not to have to to carry all this, all this, um, um, all the weight of that those confusing teachings and those wrong teachings with us, that we would have, like if we would uh, stay in the Novus Ordo Church, you know, or if we let's say try to recognize this still as the Catholic Church, we would always have to 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 come to a solution for this contradiction and then be again um, like uh, stopped by the authorities, the so-called authorities who don't really don't like the, the spread of the true Catholic teaching. So what I think is 
and why we should, I think, be optimistic about our position um, is that we can be truly um, Catholic. And I think it's, it helps if we see the situation today as what it is, as a type of persecution where they um, went, as we said before, they went into the church and they, 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 they destroyed the church from within. And so they left with a different, whatever the different religion that they founded, and we can stay um, truly Catholic. And in this, like in every time of persecution, if, if you really stick to uh, the true Catholic Church, you experience that supernatural support. And I think everybody who uh, goes that way uh, at one point notices that, that there is the supernatural support. And that's a really great experience. Um, so I could maybe could say like, like in any time of persecution, the nice thing about it is, um, it sounds maybe, sounds maybe funny, but to be in that persecution and to accept the persecution and to live the Catholic Church under this sort of let's say pressure, and um, it's really nice to see also how people appreciate if you stick to something that might be not. Um, might be not um, mainstream today, and if you hold hold on to values and to firm principles, and human beings seem to to have a feeling and, and and to have a feeling that this is something great, no matter which area. Now, I mean, gen in general, if somebody sticks to principles and sticks to difficult positions, that is very much appreciated by by human beings normally if they admit it. I think. And that's something we can today experience a lot and be a light for the people and show them um, how we uh, um, live the faith. And people are so disappointed today, as we said before, now when we see the fruits, you know, from the Novus Order changes, people are so disappointed by this wishy-washy wishy and this... Um, it, it doesn't give them any anything anymore, because people want something, something real, something concrete, and something, something, something strong. And um, so we can show people today, and this is, I think, the the great thing. We can show under this situation of this uh, persecution, we can sh show people that it is it's possible to have a firm faith, to have to not go with the flow, and still be nice and still be happy and still live on a, let's say, attractive life. And uh, this is, I think, a great witness that we can um, bear today for the world, a great challenge, a great, um, a great, um, a great job that God gives us, that we can show that to the world. And uh, it's a challenge. And if you, if you pick it up, then I think it gives you a really satisfy, sat satisfaction and happiness that you will manage to be happy even in these um, difficult times. Yeah, that's, that's perfectly said. And I, and I think it's really interesting. It made me think of um, Jordan Peterson, who's, I don't think he's Catholic, unfortunately, but he's a, a famous psychologist right now. I'm sure everyone's heard of him. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he he really, his whole shtick, his whole thing is preaching responsibility and taking responsibility on your back and, and doing the little things. He, he always says, go clean your room, your own room first. And they're pretty simple things, and they're hard things. And he's telling all these things to go and stop being a, a lazy bum. And that's that's really his whole message. And he he comes out and he says he's absolutely shocked. He's absolutely shocked at the success he's seen with his message. His message is is not easy. It's not fun. It, it's it's go and and do the right thing. And, and yeah, again, he's not Catholic, but it just speaks to people want truth they, they want the right way they want responsibility and, and even more so even far more than jordan peterson is 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 people do crave truth and they crave that responsibility and in the the church gives us that and and father borough I'd, I'd ask you that i mean I, I, I we heard that from from andy that's a great show that that i did a couple of weeks ago that anyone hasn't listened to that the the mary's troublemaker it's, it's a fantastic interview with a guy from ireland and, and it just makes me think he mentioned that now is the time when people are open to hear about the faith. And and, and Father Borah, do you have any comments on that? Or anything that Father Heine said? 
Well, I, I, I think Father put it very well. And I, for myself, I was recently working with a convert, and I would say a convert in the aspect that they were coming back, or coming to the set of a contest position after having been in the indult uh, for many, many years. And they, one of the things they said once they uh, they accepted or they came to the realization of what was going on, and they said, you know, set of a contest position is the best explanation for what is going on in the church today. They said that it was like a weight was lifted off their shoulders, and they were able to focus on their spiritual life because they said that up to this time, they had been pretty much any t every Sunday they'd go to Mass, there's always something that came up that would come up, and it would always agitate them or aggravate them, and it felt like they were always fighting and never able to be at peace, never able to really focus on their spiritual growth. And that's one of the things that this convert was saying was that they just they they just feel so much at peace and they're able to really focus on the spiritual life when they don't have to fight against what they see or what they know is is not Catholic. This is basically what what I, I meant too. It is nice that Father puts it that well, that um that he, uh, they, they, we don't have to fight against those contradictions that people meet every Sunday if they, if they go to the Novus Ordo Church, you know, they meet all those. Um, I mean, so many people know that there's something wrong, and they don't know where to go, and they don't have uh, found a solution maybe yet. But um, so it's really nice that we have the opportunity to build something positive and build something. Is something without that um, that all that weight that uh, those people have to carry around, I guess you know. Right, and 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 also the right the beauty of actually respecting the the papacy and actually respecting the church that, that came before, and and we respect it so much that we don't want to give in to these these crazy mm -hmm. heresies and apostasies that that Bergoglio and his squad are are making almost daily. And that's very important that you say that because. What we do is not because we are against the papacy or whatever, but it is because, as you just said, you know, because we want to keep the papacy clean or the papacy, we hold the papacy, the, the papacy very highly. And one of the nice things that I heard that helped me a lot is about the church. You know, it's the church is the spotless pride of Christ. And um, so um, this is basically coming back to the point that the hell has prevailed against the church. If that Novus Ordo Church would be the Church of Christ, then we would have a spotted um, uh, pride of Christ, which is a con which can't be. But we want to hold on to that that spotless pride of Christ, uh, pride of pride of Christ. Did I say that right? Pride. Bride. Yeah. Bride. 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 Bride, bride of Christ, and so we want to hold on to the spotless um, pride of Christ, and. Um, and this is why we do that, you know. And so that's very good that you mentioned that point at the end, at the end now here. Yeah. And so, Father Borja, how can how can people say to the contest? How can they try to be more traditional Catholics? You know, more just actual Catholics than trying to hammer home the idea that we are different and we are these these fighters backed into a corner, which I think our our grandparents and parents were. Right. Well, I we I see it on Twitter because I'm I'm on Twitter and I see that we get accused often of being a fringe group, you know, being these schismatics and this and that. And it's like no, I I think that our our goal is to show the beauty of our Catholic faith, and that's actually one of my the reason why I'm on Twitter is because I just simply want to show people the beauty of our Catholic faith, um, to show that you know I adhere to the sit of a contest position, yes. But in those I, I'm, I and uh, other say they, the contests are simply Catholics striving to be loyal to the church and striving to to love Holy Mother the Church and and work through this this unprecedented time, this uh, this time of of crisis. And I think that that's one of the things that, like the early the early Christians, many you know, they wasn't like they were out in the streets. Um, you know, preaching from the rooftop, so to say, when they were being persecuted, they simply lived their faith, and people knew that, that or suspected uh, certain people to be Christians, to be Catholics, because of their charity, because of their, of the virtues that they practiced and that they exemplified. And I think that that's what we need to do: is simply live our faith 
uh, practice the virtues and practice especially charity. As our Lord said, by this will all men know that you're my disciples, that you have love for one another. And we have to especially uphold this virtue because our Lord said at the end of time, the charity of many will go cold. And so for us, as as said of Acantus, as trying to be loyal Catholics, just simply living our faith day in and day out, like I said, practicing those virtues and striving to sanctify ourselves. Father, do you, uh, Heine, do you want to add to that? Uh, I mean, that was very nice. And uh, it's... Um... It's uh, that's one of the reasons why this this expression "zedevacantism" is maybe uh, something that we don't really um, primarily, I guess, want to call us because I mean, so many people ask us, well, "What group do you belong to? What are you?" and stuff, and it's so hard for us sometimes to give a name, and that's a good thing because we didn't start a new um, whatever um, sect or a group, whatever. We are still, we just remain Catholic, as, as Father just said. So um, I think we, uh, what we are is basically um, Catholics who try to keep living the Catholic faith whilst those authorities of this new um, religion teach a new faith and call themselves Catholic, which is, um, which is misleading people. And um, so um, this is... And like Father just said, by living that faith, and we have that chance today to live the Catholic faith, 100%, the, the faith of Christ, let's say, 100%. And by doing this, we can save so many souls. And this should be our primary primary goal. I think it's not prim primary to uh, primarily that we fight against um, something, but we uh, try to uh, save souls. And that's why we Let's say, as, let's say, as priests, we we administer the true sacrament, the unchanged sacraments, and we teach the the teaching of Christ. We say the true uh, mass instituted by Christ, and this is um, primarily because those are the means that Christ has given us to save our souls, but also to save um, our neighbor, to save the people, to to save souls, the souls of the people. And I mean, this is coming back to the, the the chance that we have today in our position. We are we have the chance to to uphold and to hold on to the the sources of grace, to the true sources of grace, where the true divine power comes from. And unfortunately, um, the Novus Order Church they have changed all the sacraments and the the mass and so forth. And there is no, there is no, they cut off the stream of grace. And so this is our chance, what we can give people today um, and help people to find again is the access to the true, true sacraments um, that we hold on to. And that's why we, we are basically just Catholics who try to uphold that, um, that Catholic faith that gives the divine, divine strength and the, the access to the divine um, to divine graces. Yeah, and, and I think it's it's interesting to see on social media or elsewhere that if you post a a picture of of a church or or a live stream of the ordinations or something, mm -hmm. I'll see people comment, "Oh, I wish we still had incense," or "Oh, I wish we still said Latin," or "Or oh, it's so beautiful with the the old um, vestments," or or whatever. And, and people are in in intrinsically that they want to follow beauty you know the actual beauty and, and that's something that you can just you can give people immediately with the true beauty of the of the of the true faith and i think that that and also as as father borja said earlier is even more important is to act like good catholics and christians ourselves and that that includes on social media to to be a good catholic and to to show that that you are the ones who have the truth and not not going and slamming down someone's door and trying to, you know, point your finger in their face and telling them that they're wrong. And I think that, you know, you, you, you get more flies by honey than vinegar. I mean, I don't want Catholics to, to be the flies, but it's, it's a very true, true idea, I think. Yeah. And that's what I, for example, what I liked about and what I like about our group, I think that we uh, already kind of managed that we are not so, so much, um, um, uh, talking, talking about 
other people. Um, and uh, but we 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 are we try to do something positive, you know. And that's what I liked about or what I like about um, our bishop, like Bishop Ibarunas. I think he he understands that very well. That we don't define ourselves by talking bad about other people, but we define ourselves by talking positive about the truth. And um, that's what I could experience when I at my time in America, in Omaha. Um, that what I liked about that that spirit and the in the group of um, the CMRI, but also the other priests who work together with with uh, Bishop Ivarunas. Yeah, and I mean Father Borja, you could speak well. We we talked about this in a previous episode about the the growth of of traditional Catholicism and of the CMRI in the U.S. And I don't know if you can maybe summarize that real quickly again for those who may have missed that show and just tell a little bit about the excitement that we are seeing in, in the actual physical growth of, of this CMRI and traditional Catholicism in America. Yes, well, I mean, I think as another, I heard another priest say that uh, Francis is, the, is our best uh, advertisement in the aspect that he has had many, he's, he's opened the eyes of many uh, just by the crazy things that he said, the, in the, the contradictions to the, to the direct contradictions to what the church has taught. And so a lot of people are, are asking questions and are searching uh, and are trying to find out what's what's going on. And but I, I you know, I for myself, I just I work in a parish that has um, large. Uh, we have about 400 parishioners and there's been a lot of people that have come and asked questions and, and are, are searching for the truth. And you see this, I think, in a lot of the other parishes. A lot of them have grown recently. Um, we In Minnesota, we recently acquired a, a new church. Um, so the bishop went up there and did the blessing of that of that new church up there. Um, and, and the bishop was, has said that there's there's such a high demand for, for priests and for the true mass and sacraments. And uh, that's why we try to burn the candle both ends, just to uh, reach souls and to save as many souls as we can. But I think that, like I was mentioning earlier, there, there's just that interest and that that thirst for the truth. And you can definitely see that in our parishes and in the people that have uh, come recently, uh, like I said, in search of the truth. Right. I had a lady email me the other day about a different show, and she said that she was in, I believe she said in 2019, she was an atheist, and then she just happened to stumble across Father Grunenthal's parish in Phoenix. And, you know, a year and a half later or a year later, I think she was she was baptized and then found her husband, got married, and and, and is going to have a baby, I think, in the future. I think that's a – it's a beautiful story that I think there there are really these stories of conversion more and more and more. And I think that now is the time. And I think that – and for, for one, I also want to comment that everyone should definitely pray for more vocations and, and never forget to support your, your religious and your priests that – that, like you say, burn the candle on both ends, trying to to reach people all over the U.S. or all over the world or Europe, in, in Father Heine's case. And so, don't don't ever forget the sacrifices that they make, and they do it for God and for us. And we should make sure we take care of them as well. But it, but it is it is beautiful just to see that the time is ripe. It is the time is now. I think for us to to go and, and convert people, and and it doesn't have to be priests that do it. And I think that yeah, I mean there there are plenty of different ways for for people to spread the word of God. If it's if it's over social media, I guess that that's fine. If it's just literally talking to your neighbor over over the hedge, you know, and and because many people are are interested, and I've had several people here in Germany, not not to me, but to to Ina or or other friends be really surprised that we are still having mass, you know, we're still having services and, and they are not almost to a, to a person there, there are no masses or, or services or whatever that there are in other religions. And I think that really impresses people. And so I guess, I mean, to, to end, um, what, what should people, what should people aim for in, in these times of, <laughs> of difficulty in the world and, and in Rome, well, what should be our our mindset as traditional Catholics and not save a contest? I, I'll ask you, Father Heine, first. Um, <clears throat> I could start with 
an advantage that I also see in our times today is that we are very international. And um, by the fact that we are maybe few people in different countries and we are very connected, at least now and more and more, um, you um, experience so many different ways of living the faith or different mentalities, different uh, different um, the characters or different uh, habits like in the countries. And this is a, a richness that we have. And I, I had the privilege, as I said, you know, to to see that in America. And uh, I mean, I think I noticed that every country has their advantages. You know, we have in Germany, there are certain things that are good. I mean, I'm talking about like German, the German Catholics. Um, the Catholic faith is, is the same everywhere, but there are certain different, of course, different mentalities and stuff and ways to 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 um, approach the faith or, or live the faith, let's say. And uh, there are very big advantages like how or nice sides, how people I got to know in America live the faith, you know, the, the faith, like the, the simplicity and the, the childlike faith that they have. And so it's such a living faith. Uh, that we in Germany, we kind of tend to maybe uh, be very um, think a lot and stuff. And that has advantages too, because we can we, do, we go very deep and stuff. But sometimes it's nice to have them both, you know, to, um, to have that thinking side and also have that practical, practical and um, let's say simple or childlike living faith, you know. And um, this could be an answer to your question, what should we do today? I think the, the most important thing, and that's what I try to tell people sometimes, because many, many people, and I understand that, because they have this eager to do something, to go out, to go out and tell people and, and preach and stuff. And, and, and what do you say, Mish, be missionaries in our times. Um, but I, I say, you know, one of the best things, or the first thing, the best thing you can do is to live your faith uh, good and with joy. And by this, you can you can make such an impression um, on, uh, like you said before, the, your neighbor, you know, like uh, the people that we meet. And this is mostly the area that we can reach um, mostly anyways, only at least people who don't have like uh, much time to go, who have a family, let's say, and don't have the time to be much on, on social media or to, to write articles or whatever. And um, so I think the what we should do today in our time is to live the faith well and with with that with with a sign that people can see that this faith satisfies us, we you know, with that satisfaction and this this joy. And um, I think if we do that then we are we are that light that Jesus wants us to be in the world. Perfect. Father Borja, any last words? Well, no, I, I think Father said it very well. And just the that whole aspect of of being being joyful and, and having that love for our faith and that love for our faith and that joy will be noticed. You know, our Lord tells us to let your light shine before men so that they see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So we we let our light shine forth, and when it we, when we we need to be a light in this dark world that we live in, um, but know that Christ is is victorious. Christ has already won the victory on the cross for us, and uh, for us it's just to persevere and to stand close to that cross and carrying our cross daily and following Him as as He tells us to. Perfect. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. Um, I'd love to have you both on again. I'm sure we'll find something else to talk about. Um, Father Heine, Father Borja, thank you again, and God bless. Thanks, God bless Kevin. You, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, bye-bye. You've been listening to the Catholic Family Podcast. If you enjoyed this show, please share it with your friends and family. You can support the production on Patreon and PayPal, and you can reach Kevin at kevin89davis at gmail.com. Ad maiorem de gloriam. All for the greater glory of God.